Hello, and welcome to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Please hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to support me. It helps a lot. You can also join my Patreon. We are in the midst of a fundraiser there and I will talk about that at the end of the video. Just as the field of forensic sciences was starting to grow, and just as the world of psychology was beginning to study the killer in ways it never had, a monster was stalking Canada. Because this serial killer was active at a time when so many other serial killers were working, we don't know nearly as much about him. In fact, I had a difficult time digging up anything past the very bland and general information about this man. I always find it so interesting. There are certain killers that just grab the media attention and get so much press, but very similar killers don't get the same treatment. This man was much more handsome, in my opinion, than Ted Bundy, at least when he was young. He didn't age so well. <laughs> is that the difference? This man wasn't American. Is that the difference? Why are we not as interested in this killer as we are so many others operating in this area? Now, I will tell you that this killer is most often called the vampire rapist. But because creator platforms have demonized that word, which is something I strongly disagree with, that is the actual name of the actual crime, I'm not going to use that word over and over today. But if you're wanting to dive in and look this killer up, that's the name you'll want to search. This is the story of Wayne Clifford Bowden, Bowden the Vampire. I'm your host, Stacy Lee. Let's begin. Montreal in Quebec is one of Canada's largest cities. It's a city rich in culture and the arts. There are a lot of fabulous restaurants and great nightlife as well. July of 1967 was a beautiful summer in Quebec. There was a world event called Expo 67 that went from April to October, and people came from all over the world to visit this event. It was a huge success. In fact, one of the most successful World's Fairs in history. People in their 20s flocked to Montreal to not only see the fair, but to work there. And so the bars were packed in the evenings well into the early morning hours that summer. One of the people enjoying the nightlives was named Norma Viancourt, who moved to Montreal to become a school teacher. She wasn't married and she lived alone in an apartment she rented on Davidson Street, which is in the east end of Montreal. This area, at the time anyway, is apparently not a very safe area of town, but the rent was cheap, which is why I'm sure Norma rented there. It was unusual to see a woman, a single woman, living in an apartment on Davidson Street by herself. On July 22, 1967, Norma spent the day in the city and then returned to her apartment that evening. The next day, Norma had plans to meet her friends for another day at the World's Fair, but she didn't show up. Then at 4.30 that afternoon, a call came into the police, but the caller didn't want to give his name. He said that a young woman had become sick and she needed immediate medical attention. This anonymous caller gave the police an address on Davidson Street. The police arrived at Norma's apartment and found it open. They stepped inside and called out Norma's name, but there was no answer. The police went farther inside the apartment and then they went into Norma's bedroom. There they found her, naked and dead, lying face up on her bed. There were only a few drops of blood on the bed sheets, so her cause of death was not readily apparent. But then, when homicide detectives arrived and the forensic photographer began taking photos, it was obvious. The woman had deep, vicious bite marks all over her breasts. That was the source of the blood on the sheets, but not the cause of death. Norma had been strangled. The investigation began and immediately went nowhere. Neighbors hadn't heard or seen a thing. No one had any information. They couldn't even locate the man who had made the anonymous phone call. Some of the cops theorized it was perhaps a boyfriend who didn't want to get involved. Other cops thought it was the killer himself who had called. 
They searched the neighborhood. They dusted for fingerprints and found none. The lock on Norma's door wasn't even broken, so that led police to believe that Norma let her killer in. They really had very little information to go on. Norma's death made the newspapers, but the police kept the details about the bite marks completely private. Within weeks, sadly, most people had forgotten all about the murder. By 1968, the east end of Montreal was experiencing a crime wave. There was an average of one murder per week in Montreal at the time, and the east end was prone to robberies and even shootouts with the police. It wasn't unusual to hear about a murder in the city, but then a pattern began to emerge and the murders got everyone's attention. In 1968, a young woman named Shirley Odette moved to Montreal from a small suburb to get a better paying job. Shirley was enjoying her new life and she dated a lot of young men. On October 2nd, 1969, Shirley got home from an evening out and entered her apartment in the Dorchester West neighborhood. Later that evening, she called one of her girlfriends and told her that she was scared. Something was bothering her and she said she had felt nervous all day, but she didn't tell her girlfriend what. Shirley just kept saying, I have a bad feeling. Her friend tried to calm her down and then the two hung up. Ladies, men, it is always important that you listen to your intuition. It is the greatest gift you've got. Listen to it. What you've got going on here, that gift that you're born with, some of us I think have better intuition than others, but, but listen to your intuition. The police then received a panicked phone call. Someone had stumbled onto something horrific. The cops arrive at an apartment complex in Dorchester West and walk around the back of the building where they've been told to go. They turn the corner and begin to walk down a very dirty and dingy alleyway. There at the bottom of an iron fire escape staircase is the body of Shirley Odette. She was laying on her back, her eyes were wide open, she was wearing a little mini dress and she's barefoot, but her shoes are just feet away from her body. Homicide detectives then arrive and begin to discuss the crime scene. Was Shirley chased out of her shoes or did the killer take them off after he killed her? And then a reporter, skirt for just a second, can we just talk about how reporters used to be allowed not only on the crime scene, but they were literally like standing there with the cops looking at everything. They were allowed to just stand over the bodies, take photos, walk through the crime scene. It's, it's wild. This obviously is something we don't allow anymore, but yes, a reporter is right there on the crime scene. And he asks one of the detectives um, what this foam was that was coming out of Shirley's mouth and nose. And the detective explained to the reporter that when people get strangled, it's common to see this kind of frothy blood come from the nose. So when they saw that, the police were pretty sure they had another strangling. Shirley's body is taken to the morgue and the coroner begins an autopsy. Yes, he confirms that she has been strangled, but there is something else. Deep, penetrating bite wounds on her breasts. One of the cops I saw interviewed about this case said that from time to time, you will see a bite mark on a victim or a murder victim, but not like these. These were vicious wounds. The perpetrator was tearing with his teeth at these women. The bite marks not only broke the skin, but went very, very deep into the skin. The officers that worked on Shirley's murder were not the same officers that worked Norma's murder, but thankfully the two groups of cops very quickly put together the fact that they might be dealing with the same killer. Remember, the information about the bite marks was not released to the public, but the police knew this information and it was more than a little concerning to them. Investigators began interviewing all the young men that Shirley Audette had been on dates with. None of the men really stuck out to police as someone who would do such a thing, but we all know killers are just normal everyday people. They don't always stand out. The police looked carefully into each of the men's alibis and one by one, they had to rule them out. A week after the murder and having thoroughly searched the alleyway where Shirley was found, the police had hit a brick wall. Just like in Norma's case, they weren't having any luck finding their killer. 
and an uneasy period of silence and peace began. Uneasy because Montreal police were convinced they had a serial killer on their hands and they were just waiting for him to strike again. Sadly, he did not disappoint them. Twenty-year-old Marielle Archambault had moved to Montreal from a tiny town in Canada with hopes of a more exciting life. She took a job working at a jewelry store, and she was really popular with the customers. Like Norma and Shirley, Marielle lived in the east end of Montreal because the rent was cheaper, even though the neighborhood was a bit rough. She lived by herself in a very small apartment on Ontario Street. Marielle had a lot of different guys she went on dates with. It wasn't unusual for her to have three or four dates a week, all with different men. But by mid-November, Marielle was saying some things to her co-workers at the jewelry shop that worried them. She told the other women she worked with that she'd met someone she thought might be a little dangerous, but she was intrigued with this man. On November 25th, 1969, a young man appeared at the jewelry store at the end of Marielle's shift to pick her up. Other people in the jewelry store watched Marielle walk over to the man, who she called Bill, and she asked him to wait in the lobby until she finished with her shift. Marielle was a French speaker, but she spoke to Bill in English. Marielle finished her shift and her co-workers watched as she walked out of the lobby and then out onto the streets with Bill. The next morning, Marielle did not show up for work, which was completely out of character for her. Her co-workers were concerned and so was her boss. By mid-afternoon, after they'd been calling all morning, they were in a panic. They had called Marielle's apartment over 10 times and they decided it was time to call the building manager and they told him they were concerned something was wrong. So the maintenance man let himself into Marielle's apartment. Just steps inside that apartment, he saw her. Marielle was lying on her back on the sofa wearing a robe. She was staring up at the ceiling and she was not moving. The maintenance man realized she was dead and he called the police. Investigators arrived and realized this scene was all too familiar. There were clear indications of sexual assault and there was bruising around Marielle's neck. The state of the apartment was the same as the other two crime scenes. There was no damage to the door indicating that Marielle had allowed her tacker in and there was not a crime scene that you would expect where things were tipped over and disturbed. Marielle's family was notified and the investigation began. As the police continued to go through her things, they found a photo of a young man with dark hair in Marielle's dresser drawer. They showed the photo to all of Marielle's close friends and they showed it to her family members. No one knew who the man in the photo was. A few days passed and the police worked their way through the interviews that are always done after a murder and then they made their way to Marielle's place of employment, the jewelry shop. Cops also took the photo of the man they found in her dresser drawer, the man no one else could identify. Marielle's co-workers saw the man in the photo and said, yes, he did look a little bit like the person that Marielle had met and called Bill, the man who was waiting for her at work days before the last day anyone saw her. The police then decided they had to release the photograph to the public, and this is when the public first learned that there were three murders connected by similarities, but cops still did not release the information about the bite marks. The city of Montreal, especially the east side, was plastered with posters of the man's face and the man's name, Bill. The police hoped that someone might put the name Bill together with the photograph. They hoped someone would come forward with more information about the man. Over the next several weeks, hundreds of phone calls came into the Montreal police. Caller after caller thought they might know who the man in the photograph was. They would give the police their suspect's name, the police would call the man in for questioning, and one by one, they would have to rule him out. There was not full-out panic in the streets, 
but there was great concern. I even heard one reporter say that men who were actually named Bill were going by something else in the bars because they knew if they told a woman that their name was Bill, they'd have no chance at getting a date with her or getting her to come home with them. That reminds me of the story of the Son of Sam where girls with long dark hair were cutting their hair off or tying it up and putting it under a scarf. As the police continued to investigate, it happened again. In January of 1970, 24-year-old Jean Way moved from Newfoundland to Montreal and took a job at a bank. Jean lived alone, but unlike the other victims, she lived in a very nice area of Montreal. On January 16th, a photo studio owner was going about his daily business when Jean came running into his shop in a panic, saying that there was a man outside bothering her and she was afraid. Jean asked the Photoshop owner if she could leave through his back door so the man in front of the store wouldn't know where she had gone and the owner said yes, of course. The shop owner then let Jean out the back door and he watched to make sure that this man in front of the store was nowhere in sight and then he went back to his work. The next day, Jean's boyfriend, Brian Caulfield, arrived at her apartment on Lincoln Street for a date that they had planned days earlier. Brian rang the doorbell, but Jean didn't come to the door, so he rang again. Nothing. Brian figured that Jean was running late, so he went downstairs to grab a drink at the bar on the ground floor. 30 minutes later, he went back to Jean's apartment. He rang the doorbell a third time and still no answer. Brian then decided to try the doorknob and realized that the door was unlocked. So he opened it and went inside. He called for Jean, but she didn't answer. He walked towards her bedroom and there he found his girlfriend lying on her back, staring up at the ceiling. Jean was dead. This time there were signs of a struggle. Jean's bra had been torn from her body and the room was a mess. The waist tie that went on Jean's robe was tied around her neck and had been used to strangle her. Brian was shocked at what he saw and he immediately called the police. Jean's body was sent off for autopsy. She had been sexually assaulted. She had been strangled to death, but there were some things that were different at the crime scene. The bite marks were present, but they were not as deep and the scene was chaotic, police began to surmise that Brian Caulfield had actually interrupted the attack. The police actually believe that when Brian went and knocked on the door, Jean was being murdered. And that is why the scene was a mess and that is why the bite marks were not so deep. I don't wanna to get too graphic here, but it takes time to bite that hard. The police interviewed Brian for hours and they became convinced he had nothing to do with Jean's murder. The police continued to investigate all three murders, but they were getting nowhere. And then things got even worse. Someone came forward and identified the man in the photograph found in Marielle's dresser drawer. He was just an old friend of hers who had died in an accident, and Marielle kept his photo as a reminder of their friendship. He had nothing to do with the murders. The police now had four murders on their hands, murders that they firmly believed were committed by the same man, a serial killer, even though that term was not being used yet, and they had no leads. The investigations all came to a dead end, and for months there was absolutely no progress. The murders also stopped, so they knew the killer had either disappeared from the area or he was in what we would now call a cooling off period. They didn't use that verbiage back then. Then in the spring of 1971 in Calgary, Alberta, 33 year old Elizabeth Porteous was living alone in this high rise apartment building. Elizabeth was a high school teacher who was well liked and well respected. She had never been married and she'd been living alone in the apartment for about three years. Elizabeth took a little weekend vacation with a friend. At one point, the two women split up so they could do a little shopping on their own. And Elizabeth went into a bar for a drink. And while she was there, she met a young man that she began talking with. Elizabeth and the man exchanged phone numbers and agreed to meet back up in Calgary. On May 17th, 1971, Elizabeth told her co-workers at the high school she worked at that she was going on a first date with this man she'd met while on vacation. The next morning, Elizabeth did not show up to teach her classes. This was very alarming as Elizabeth's entire life was at that school. She would never 
just not show up for class. School administrators began calling Elizabeth's phone number, but she never picked up. Again, the building caretaker, a man named Morris Lutz, was tasked with going into Elizabeth's apartment to check on her. The maintenance man and the building manager went to Elizabeth's apartment door. As soon as they opened that door, they gasped. She was lying right there, feet from the door, on her back, staring up at the ceiling, and she was dead. Elizabeth was only half dressed. The maintenance men contacted the police and homicide detectives arrived immediately. The CSI photographer took hundreds of photos before anything was touched. Elizabeth's dress was torn open and the buttons were missing from her dress as well. Again, there were deep, dark, vicious bite wounds on Elizabeth's breasts, much different from the bite marks they'd seen before. This time the killer had bitten completely through the breast until his teeth met. Ooh, the hatred, you know, you, you can feel the rage and the hatred for these women. Elizabeth's body was taken for autopsy and the CSI team continued investigating at her apartment. That's when they realized the killer had wiped down not only the coffee table and the doorknob on the front door, but even the kitchen appliances. This was someone who knew police procedure and techniques, and he was trying to cover his tracks. However, the killer did miss something. Elizabeth's dress was missing eight buttons. The police found seven of them, but not the eighth. They wondered if the killer had taken it as a souvenir. And then they got a call from the coroner. As the coroner was doing the autopsy, he sat Elizabeth up to undress her. And when he did, a cuff link fell out of Elizabeth's dress. The cuff link had come off the killer during the attack and had become deeply embedded in the skin of Elizabeth's shoulder. Now remember, this murder took place in Calgary. The other four murders were in Montreal. So the police were not making any type of connection between the events, but soon they would. Police interview Elizabeth Ann Porteous' co-workers at the high school, and they learned that she had plans to go on this first date with an unknown man the night before she was discovered dead. Her co-workers didn't know the man's name or anything about him, but then, incredibly, they got a huge break. A man named Harry Robinson, who worked with Elizabeth, was driving with his wife on a busy road in Calgary on the night Elizabeth went on her date. And they actually saw Elizabeth in the car with the man that no one knew. This is such an incredible coincidence or you know whatever you wanna believe. But because Elizabeth was 33 years old and single, people were very interested in who she was dating. In that time, that was old to still be single and not have any kids. The talk of Elizabeth going on this date had kind of got around the school. And so Harry and his wife took special note to see who this man was and what he was driving. Harry and his wife told police that the man was young, about 24 or 25. He and Elizabeth were chatting and laughing and Elizabeth was in the same dress that she was found in at the murder scene. Well, this was great information, but what the cops were really interested in was the car. Luckily, Harry Robinson was a car guy. He said it was a powder blue or gray Mercedes about three years old, and there was something else. In the rear window of the car was a light brown toy, an item popular back in the 70s, I guess, for some car owners. I didn't know these things existed clear back then, but it was a bobblehead. It's what we would call a bobblehead, you know? But this one was an animal. Harry thought it was a dog or maybe a camel. The police went directly to the traffic office and began looking through the catalogs for powder blue or gray Mercedes made from 1965 to 1971. Remember, there were no computers at this time. So these guys are going through these records by hand, page by page by page. I think years from now, people will say, remember back when you had to type everything like on a keyboard? We're all gonna have like chips in our head where we just think something and it goes onto the computer screen. I don't know, who knows? But for hours, the police sat in this very small room, writing down each and every Mercedes that matched that description. 
Then they came to a powder blue Mercedes owned by a man that lived very close to Elizabeth Porteous. They decided not to tip him off. They drove to his address and there they saw the car. They walked around the back and there it was, the bobblehead toy sitting in the back window. The cops called headquarters and told their bosses what they'd found. They then went and knocked on the door of the car's owner after getting his address. 24-year-old Wayne Bowden answered the door. The police did not tell Wayne why they were there, just that they needed to speak with him, and Wayne willingly went with the police. They got to the police station, and as they sat in the interview room, Wayne was told that the police were investigating the murder of Elizabeth Porteous, and they asked Wayne if he knew her, and he said yes, he did. He'd actually been on a date with her. They went to dinner. Wayne remained completely calm and didn't seem upset at all by the police questions. Wayne claimed he took Elizabeth home and left her alive in the apartment before driving home about a block to his house. He denied he had anything to do with the murder. Then the police asked Wayne Bowden if he'd lost anything lately, and Wayne said yes, he had. He had lost a cuff link while he was at Elizabeth's apartment. This guy is smart. He's covering his tracks, you know? One of the cops pulled the cuff link out in an evidence bag and showed it to Wayne and asked, is this the cuff link you lost? And Wayne said, yes. <laughs> Wayne thought he was explaining away why this find of an object belonging to him, you know, would be there. But what Wayne didn't know is that the cuff link was found embedded in Elizabeth's back shoulder area during the attack. This was enough. The police were able to get a warrant and Wayne Bowden was arrested on the spot. As he sat in jail, he continued to proclaim his innocence, stating that he'd simply lost the cufflink while he was at Elizabeth's apartment. Then the police had what turned out to be a revolutionary idea, one that to us, looking back from 2024, seems like the very obvious thing to do, but back then it was groundbreaking. The police hired an orthodontist to look at the bite marks left on the victims and compare those bite marks to Wayne Bowden's teeth. One of the Canadian cops had read an article where a similar technique had been used in England, and so they decided to try it. Dr. Gordon Swan was enlisted to help. Wayne Bowden was taken by police to Dr. Swan's office and forced to sit in his chair. Dr. Swan took dental impressions of Wayne Bowden's teeth. While police waited for Dr. Swan to make his analysis, they began looking into Wayne Bowden's past, and that's when they discovered that he'd recently moved from Montreal. What they found almost blew them away. The police in Calgary were shocked to hear that there were four women murdered in Montreal who had all been strangled and bitten on the breasts by the killer a killer they had not yet been able to catch. The Montreal police were ecstatic to learn that their killer may have been caught. Everyone waited on pins and needles for the dental impressions to come back. But while they waited, they went through Wayne Bowden's apartment. And guess what they found there? The eighth button from Elizabeth Porteous's dress, the button they couldn't find in her apartment. Wayne had taken it as some type of memento. The orthodontist then contacted the police with his report. The bite marks left on Elizabeth Porteous' body were an exact match to Wayne Bowden's teeth. Finally, confronted with all the evidence, Wayne Bowden told police that he drove Elizabeth home after their date and he didn't know why, but he just snapped. He admitted he attacked her and killed her. Sure, Wayne, you just snapped. The police then began to press Wayne Bowden about the murders in Montreal, and soon he had confessed to them as well. Now, I need to tell you there was a lot of speculation about the murder of Norma Viancourt. She has never been officially tied to Wayne Bowden, but many people were convinced he was her killer. Wayne Bowden fully admitted to killing Shirley, Marielle, and Jane, but firmly denied killing Norma. Why would he do that? Wayne would also not admit to sexually assaulting the women. He claimed the sex was consensual. He didn't want to be known as a rapist. Big ego, right? He doesn't need to rape women. He can get it on his own. One of the cops asked Wayne, don't you think the families deserve to know what you did to their loved ones? And Wayne said back, there's nothing you can do for those families, but you can do something for me. 
Basically, Wayne was asking to be segregated from other criminals in jail because he knows what happens to sex offenders in prison. At trial, Wayne Bowden recanted everything he'd told police and once again began proclaiming his innocence. The prosecution brought out all of the evidence that at the time was cutting edge. They showed the jury the bite marks in an overlay with Wayne Bowden's teeth and it was enough. Wayne Bowden was convicted of the murder of Elizabeth Porteous and sentenced to life in prison. He was the first ever murderer to be convicted based on odontological evidence. Wayne was then sent to Montreal to face trial where he confessed to the murders of Shirley Audette, Marielle Archambault, and Jean Way. He was then sentenced to three additional life terms. He began his sentence at Kingston Penitentiary in February of 1972. Years later, it was found out that Wayne was telling the truth about Norma's murder. A man named Raymond Salve was convicted of her death in 1994. Now, as if this story isn't wild enough, it has a very crazy element. In 1977, Wayne Bowden was actually able to apply for and obtain an American Express card. In Canada, even as a serial killer, I just cannot believe this, you get day passes from prison. This is something that as an American, I cannot wrap my head around. You're a serial killer and you get a day pass from prison? So Wayne is on his day pass with a social worker. They go to eat lunch at the Contiki restaurant at the Mount Royal Hotel. And Wayne goes into the bathroom and escapes through the bathroom window. It's just unbelievable to me. But I mean, Ted Bundy also jumped out the courthouse window and escaped for a few days. So, you know, the 70s was just... Wayne is now on the loose for several days and then he's recaptured at a bar on McKay Street. There was an investigation launched into how Wayne escaped and into how he was able to get an American Express card, how he was able to get the company to issue him that card. <laughs> that is wild. Wayne sat in prison and he wasted away. In about 2005, he was diagnosed with skin cancer and he started rapidly declining. He died in the prison hospital on March 27th, 2006. He was 58 years old. I feel so sorry for the women who lost their lives at the hands of this monster, this actual vampire. But I'm also sad that this case isn't more well documented. I wish there were interviews with Wayne Bowden. I wish we knew more about him. I want all the information on these men because I want to know what makes them tick, what makes them do the things they do. If you ask Wayne Bowden, he'd tell you he doesn't know why. He just wanted to kill and he wanted to bite. He truly earned the moniker of the vampire rapist. Thank you for joining me today on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Hit the like button if you would and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. It helps a lot. You can also join my Patreon for a few dollars a month. You help keep the videos coming and you can also be involved in our fundraiser. This is the thumbnail on my channel that has all the information about what we're raising money for. We want to donate money to police departments in hopes of solving cold cases. All the info is in the video. I sure appreciate you, each and every one of you that watch the videos. It really means a lot to me. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other, and I will see you next time on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Bye.